Thank you so much, Noam. It's really, really wonderful to be here. Um, and welcome, welcome everyone. Um, yeah, just a, a real joy to be able to spend this morning with you in practice. Um, like Noam said, my, my name's Juliana Sloan. Um, I'm a meditation teacher, but I'm also a depth hypnosis practitioner and a shamanic counselor. And, you know, all three of these modalities um, work really beautifully together because um, each one of them offers a different lens on consciousness, on insight, on bringing forth healing, or awakening. And um, like No mentioned, I, um, I used to live in, in San Francisco and was in, involved with the, the Dharma Collective way, way back in pre-pandemic times, it feels like, yeah, another lifetime ago. Um, and, and nowadays I'm, I'm living in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is Tiwa Pueblo land. Um, and, you know, these days I, I also lead a weekly women's sangha um, for folks who identify as women to join and practice together and um, also work with people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so, it's just a, yeah, a treat to be here and really fun to be able to share, um, you know, two of my favorite practices with you and how they, they kind of move together, Buddhism and shamanic work. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a real delight to be here. And, you know, today we'll be um, really just stepping in. Um, this is really deep and rich um, material. And so to, to be able to go very deep, we'd need a, a lot more time and a lot more framework, but we're, we're really gonna be stepping into like, how do, we, how do we explore some of these more visionary practices and how do we incorporate them into our meditation, into our Buddhist practice? Um, but to begin, um, let's, just, let's just sit for a moment. And oh, Elizabeth, you're in Santa Fe. Wow, that's so cool. Um, we don't meet um, in person, we meet online over Zoom. Um, but I do hope to be doing a little bit more in-person teaching in Santa Fe at some point in the future. That's, that's so cool that we're, we're neighbors together. Wow, I love it. Um, yeah, so let's just arrive for a moment. And as we do, I really want to just invite you to just call in any, any benefactors, inspirations in your life. It could be the Buddha or Kuan Yin. It could be a, a teacher or an element of nature. You might want to call in the, the mountain or the ocean. Just to be here with us. You might envision this group joining us over Zoom, all of us together in a circle. And all of the benefactors, the supporters, the people and places that inspire us and nourish us also standing in a larger circle around us, supporting and protecting. Just taking a few breaths in this place. feeling the support that's here in this circle as we come together. And as you rest here, just allowing yourself to do whatever you need to do to fully arrive. You might envision yourself just picking up whatever you were doing before this or whatever you'll be doing after and just setting it to the side. 
knowing you can pick it up later. Feeling your body in the chair or couch or wherever you may be sitting. Hearing the sounds around you. And whenever you're ready, just opening your eyes, returning back into the circle. And I'd love to begin by inviting you to um, enter into the chat where you're zooming in from today and also what brought you here today you're welcome to do that now i'd love to get a sense for who's all in the room i know i know some of you but some of you are new to me oh, curiosity beautiful welcome down Been to feel curiosity, yeah. Salt Lake City, beautiful. Um, okay, navigating, navigating what feels like a shamanic illness. I hear you, yeah. Oklahoma, welcome. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Petaluma, oh, yeah, welcome. Hey, Audrey, welcome. So good to see you. Mm. Great. Sounds like we have a, um, yeah, a really beautiful mix actually of people who are holding a sense of curiosity and some people who already um, have stepped a little bit into some shamanic work and some understanding of this. Um, so that's wonderful. Um, okay. Practice. Great. So. I'll share a little bit to orient us. And for some of you, since um, you already have a little bit of a background in, in some of this work, it may sound super familiar to you. Um, okay. Glenn Buddhism. Welcome, Chloe. Yeah, yeah, sacred medicine. Great. Okay, great. Welcome. And so at the heart of things, as, as probably those of you who've already dabbled or, or been deep, more deeply involved in shamanic practices or, you know, Tibetan practices, Ajrayana Buddhism, um, you probably feel this sense of knowing already that at the heart of things, Buddhism and shamanism really share some essential traits. They seek to explore consciousness and they seek to bring forth a type of healing, a type of liberation, a type of balance into our lives, into the world. And, you know, the word shaman actually has etymological ties uh, all the way back to the spiritual seekers of the Buddha's day and, and before that. The word Shaman stems from the word Saman, which means one who knows. And this is coming from a language family out of Eastern Siberia. And what's pretty striking is that this root word, Saman, where Shaman comes from, is 
very, very similar, near identical um, to the, the Pali word, which is the language of the Buddha, the Pali word Samana. It's basically Saman with an A. Um, and then the Sanskrit word Sramana. And both of these words in Pali and in Sanskrit, Samana and Sramana basically mean a, a contemplative, a wandering ascetic, uh, or a monastic, like the, like the Buddha himself, and like the monks and nuns that followed and learned from the Buddha. And, you know, in many ways, a lot like us, when we go into practice or when we sit a retreat, we are um, deepening in contemplative practice. And so, you know, the way that I am holding this concept of shamanism is more like an umbrella term that's not specific to one culture or one lineage. Um, there are many cultures and many lineages that all have their own shamanic practices. And you really can go pretty much any continent in the world and find that the indigenous people of that land who lived in a way that was connected to the earth have some kind of a shamanic practice or a shamanic lineage. And this is in you know, the US, in South and Central America, in Africa, it's also all throughout Europe. Um, so this really truly is something that can be found in all cultures in many different forms. And when we start to actually notice that a lot of these shamanic lineages, there's a, a lot of overlap, there's a lot of similarity in the way that certain practices are held in certain understandings of you know, cosmology of how to engage with ordinary and non-ordinary reality. Um, and what's so, so beautiful to me about that really is it does seem that shamanic practice is an innately human thing. That by virtue of being a person in this world who has the capacity to connect to the earth, to connect to yourself, to connect to wisdom, you also have the capacity to engage in some of these shamanic contemplative practices. And this includes the lineage that the Buddhists came from, the, the Buddhist lineage that we're practicing today um, arose from a culture that was deeply influenced by shamanic practices, by animist practices, by the different cosmologies and worldviews and contemplative practices of the Buddhist day. And so when we look at the stories and the teachings of the Buddha, we start to see the echoes of these shamanic practices. We start to see this more mystic worldview kind of etched into the stories of the Buddha the Buddha, the Jataka tales, which tell about the Buddha's past life. Um, we see it in the suttas. And, you know, it's unfortunate because at this point in kind of the evolution of modern Western Dharma, a lot of those stories have been, you know, either minimized or erased. And a lot of the more um, mystic, shamanic, experiences that are, are documented in the Buddha's story kind of get shrunk down into being basically a metaphor for something larger. And a lot of the time that's how it's taught. Um, because what we're really seeing, if we start to look closer and we start to have some openness around it, what we start to see is that many of these stories are telling us about deep shamanic experiences and a different way of understanding consciousness and understanding the sacred. Um, so I, I really want to invite you to just play with at, in your own Dharma practice, in your own understanding of the, the Buddha's story and of the, the stories in that lineage. What would it be like if we didn't 
hold some of that information as just a metaphor or as a really nice teaching analogy? What if we ex just entertained the idea that it was actually talking about experiences that the Buddha had with a greater feeling? So, you know, it may get downplayed a lot because it, you know, doesn't really fit with our scientific worldview, doesn't totally fit into the more, you know, secular, modern, capitalist lens. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not a powerful source of wisdom. Doesn't mean it's not a powerful teaching. And, you know, we've seen... Um, such an explosion, you, you all know this, an explosion in the study of mindfulness and meditation and all of the scientific research that's been coming out over the last decade or so has been really proving what the Buddha already knew and taught 2,500 years ago. And we're, we're seeing like, okay, yeah, this ancient wisdom tradition, that longing to prove it, but that ancient wisdom tradition was already there. It was always there. It was always teaching us, um, even before researchers were able to validate. And, you know, we're also much like the study of mindfulness, beginning to see a really immense wave in interest in shamanic practice and its viability as a very powerful healing modality. And, you know, this, of course, includes things like psychedelic assisted therapies, but it also includes the study of shamanic journey work. Um, and as, as some of you know, um, journey work is a practice that doesn't use any mind altering substances. It's actually a contemplative practice. And some of these studies have shown that shamanic journey work actually has really significant effects on brain waves. It can create experiences of insight into things like impermanence and not self and interconnectedness, among many other things. And it can um, create a transformative experience in the same way that you know many other powerful modalities, including plant medicine, can do. And, you know, I, I definitely know and, and feel this firsthand. Some of the, the shamanic training and the shamanic work and the work that I do supporting clients in the shamanic context has been some of the most transformative and powerful that um, I've really ever had the honor to witness. There's an innate way that we're able to access uh, an altered state. Um, and get different information, get healing, um, attain insight, and be able to help ourselves and help other people through this type of work. From you know my own history with this practice, um, you know my my mother actually had a shamanic practice when I was growing up, and I I fell in love with the Dharma fell in love with Buddhism and it really worked well for me because it also let me differentiate and individuate from my mom. So for a long time, I, I wasn't actually um, doing work in the shamanic context. I was really steeped in the Dharma. Um, I trained in, in Buddhist chaplaincy. I managed a meditation center. I sat, you know, many retreats, including, you know, long one or two months retreats. Um, and what I found which is possible, I wouldn't be very surprised if um, some of you had had these, these similar experiences, were that there were things that were happening in my meditation practice in the Buddhist context that weren't as easily explained in the tradition, in the culture, in the kind of modern context that I was practicing in. Um, and I, I was primarily practicing in the insight tradition, you know, in California, which really does have its, its own culture, its own lineage, um, and specific ways of working with um, different types of experience. And, you know, as I sat longer and longer retreats, I began to have more visionary, um, what you might refer to as shamanic experiences. 
and they were very profound. They were uh, magical. They felt so onward leading and supportive to my practice. But the teachings that I was receiving didn't quite hold them. Um, you, many of you may be familiar with the, the notice noting practice uh, in, in Buddhist tradition. And the noting practice is so powerful. You know, it lets you get such precision noting your thoughts, noting your sensation, noticing what's arising, what's passing. And it can give you such a powerful sense of present moment awareness. But um, what I found was that many teachers, when there was a more visionary experience that felt more um, mystical or shamanic or energetic, um, a lot of the advice on retreat was to just note it and let it, and it, you know, just accept it as kind of a rising and passing phenomena. And that didn't totally resonate with me because the experiences that I was having um, felt much more important and much more profound than just, you know, passing phenomena in the mind. They They felt like there was, deep support, deep protection, um, important information and insight that was coming through this different way of knowing. And um, so as I continued to practice, I, I found a handful of Buddhist teachers who were really perfectly suited for what was going on for me. And these happened to be um, one Dharma teacher who's an indigenous woman who has her own connection to her own lineage that has shamanic practices. And also a couple of teachers who had just happened to have uh, shamanic training or had done journey work themselves in the past at some point um, and studied here in the US or in places like India or Nepal. And once I was able to begin to work with those teachers who um, really had this understanding of both the Dharma and this more mystical aspect of experience, I started to be able to work with what was arising in a really different way. Um, I wasn't cutting off that part of myself that was experiencing these, these more visionary things um, and knew that they were important. And, you know, eventually that did become incredibly supportive to my practice. Um, there were moments in meditation where um, things would arise and it was clear there, there was an element of, um, of protection or, or benevolence or compassion that was arising with these experiences. And so eventually, you know, some years ago now, I ended up... Um, studying the shamanic journey and starting to deepen in some of that training. And what I found was when I began to explore the shamanic work, I finally had language and a framework and an understanding for what was happening in my meditation practice. And that was wonderful. You know, it was so nice to finally feel like, oh, okay, things are starting starting to make sense. It's not just, you know, there's not one part of me that's being cut off. The whole experience here can be included. And so, you know, I continued to follow that. And I, I trained with a really brilliant teacher and continue to work with her to this day, um, Isa Guchardi, who um, some of you may know, she's taught with the Dharma Collective in the past. Um, and I, I feel so fortunate to, have her as my, my own mentor. I, I'm a teaching assistant for some of her training um, for other people learning this work and um, have worked one on work one on one professionally with people in the, the shamanic and hypnotherapeutic modalities that she's um, come to teach people and developed over the years. And so it's really a, a delight to be able to share some of this with you because I think a lot of the time, what we don't get much training on in the meditation world is how to navigate skillfully when um, 
experiences that feel like they're just kind of outside of our, our normal day to day life. And, you know, one of the most beautiful things too about shamanic practice is, oh, yeah. All right, Elizabeth, I'll put her, her name in the chat. There you go. Um, and, and Issa runs, um, an organization called Foundation of the Sacred Stream. And that's where a lot of a lot of her teachings are. Yeah. So one of the really beautiful things about shamanic work also is that it's deeply connected to the earth. And um, the earth as a source of wisdom, the earth as a source of support and protection. Um, and this ripples through again the the teachings and the stories of the Buddha, um, as as we know. And you know, today more than ever, we need to cultivate this relationship to the earth, this uh, companionship, this friendship, this collaboration with the power of the earth, because you know the earth needs us, and we deeply need the earth, even if we're living in a culture that's not treating the earth with the respect it deserves. Um, so part of the beauty of these practices is that it can help us deepen our relationship to the earth, to the, to the land around us, and allow us to actually live in greater harmony with it, um, which, gosh, we need now more than ever. So let's step into a practice. Um, this is, you know, to help step in just gently to some of the similarities here with shamanic work and Buddhist practice. I want to share uh, a meditation that what is in the, the four foundations of mindfulness. This is an element practice that the Buddha shares with people to learn as part of developing this very first foundation of mindfulness, this first foundation of developing meditation, developing the capacity for insight. And part of the first foundation of mindfulness, which is mindfulness of the body, includes practices of recognizing the elements of the earth within ourselves and seeing very clearly the ways in which we are not separate from the earth. And so I'll just invite you to close your eyes if you're ready. Letting yourself settle and arrive. Feeling the body at rest where you're sitting or laying down. And calling to mind first the earth element. The earth element is that which is solid, hard, strong, stable. You might bring to mind the image of a mountain or the earth beneath your feet. Image of rock, stone. Just first letting yourself hold this idea, this imagery of earth element. in your mind, just breathing into it and seeing if you can invite yourself to embody that earth element. Knowing that the bones 
in your body are made up of many of the same material as we'll find in the earth, in the mountains. All the calcium, all the minerals circulating throughout your entire body. are the same as that which circulates and lives in the earth element outside of us. Just now scanning through your body. the top of your head, sensing into the hardness, the solidity of your skull, your teeth, you might even run the tongue over your teeth to feel that hardness. Letting your attention Move down into the neck and the shoulders. Sensing into that earth element in the body. Feeling the earth element in the arms and the hands. All those places where there's weight, solidity, the hardness of the bone. Turning the attention to the rib cage, the spine, earth element right here within you. Down into the hips, legs, all the way down to the feet. Feeling that earth element within your body. Knowing that one day this earth element will return to the earth, that we are not separate from it. And then calling to mind the element of water. The ocean, the lakes, the rain and snow. It's allowing yourself again to envision and get close to what that water element feels like. What's the energy of it? the personality of it. Water element is that which flows, which moves. Fluidity.
just like the water element exists outside of us. That water element exists within us. Our tears so remarkably similar to the water element in the ocean. The blood in our veins. The fluidity of our digestive system and so much more, even with the moisture that's in our skin, our muscles, our organs. Just starting now at the feet, letting yourself scan the body from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head, just noticing where this water element is present. Moving attention into the legs, feeling into the, the tingling or the pulsing, you might feel the flow of blood. Moving up towards the belly the chest, noticing the water element here in the digestive system. All the organs, all the work they're doing, so steeped in that water element. Feeling the arms and hands, and again, maybe noticing that tingling or pulse of blood moving through the limbs. This water element here with us. And feeling into the water element in the head and the face. Feeling the saliva in your mouth. The moisture in your eyes. All the water element coursing through our body is that which we've taken in from the earth. We're in constant reciprocity with the lake, with the rain, with the ocean. Now just allowing yourself to turn toward the element of fire. Element of fire is temperature, warmth and cool. It's the radiance of the sun that infuses everything that we touch, everything that we are. And 
everything that we consume, all the food, all the clothing, all the warmth is in some way made possible by that fire element and nourished by it. And we can sense into the fire element present in our own bodies through the experience of temperature. Just scanning through beginning at the top of your head. Noticing warmth or cool. Temperature of the air on your skin or the feeling of heat emanating from within you. Fire element in the head, the neck, shoulders, arms, Fire element in the chest and belly. That inner warmth. Fire element in the hips. legs and feet. Fire element outside of us and inside of us are not so separate. And then turning your attention towards the air element. This element that's all around us all the time. That has movement and flow. Has a sense of spaciousness. You might imagine the air element thinking of a great sky all around you. Just letting yourself get closer to that sense of the air element, seeing if you can even feel the air element in the room around you. What is it like? What's being noticed here? And again, bringing that sense of the air element into investigation of the air element within you. Knowing that the air element is there subtly in your feet, your legs. arms and hands. But you will most strongly feel that air element 
in the breath. Rise and fall of the chest and belly. A sensation of air at the nostrils or throat. getting closer to really understanding, experiencing right now what it feels like to bring this air element into the body. Following the air element as you breathe in. and following the air element as it leaves your body. Can you really tell when you're breathing when that air element is you or when that air element is part of the earth where does that begin and end or does it Just setting down its attention to the breath now. Just feeling your entire body. Holding earth. Holding water. fire, holding air, not so separate from everything around us. And as you're ready, just gently opening your eyes. Letting yourself take a look around the room. Just reorienting. Noticing what it's like to see. Maybe even noticing as you look around if you can sense into the elements in the room around you. And whenever you're ready, just coming back into our circle. And I just want to invite you, you could type into the chat or you're welcome to raise your hand. If you'd like to share anything about what you noticed during that practice or what you experience. And if there are questions, you're also welcome to ask those.
Was there one element that was particularly strong for you? Maybe one that was a little bit harder to sense into. Okay, we have one in the chat, the fire element strong in the body. And feeling the way that the body holds all the elements at once was really wholesome. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We have all of this within us. It's amazing. Oh, nice experience of the, the breath and the air element. Yeah. Isn't it wild? It, it, you really can't tell where do we begin and where does the air end? And we really sense into that breathing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Alive and flowing and beautiful realness. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Good to feel the moisture inside. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that water element, um, it's so prominent within us, you know, 80% water but we don't always take the time to really pay attention to it. Okay, Gary says, when I, I focus on the breath, I'm able to move the prana up through the central energy channel. And as soon as you shift the focus, the prana kind of has an in, intense energetic sensation. Yeah, yeah, you're really starting to, um, sounds like you've got practice already in that, like how do we use the elements and the breath to move energy in the system? And especially like bringing up the energy into that central channel, it's, it's powerful. It's really powerful. It can be very intense. Well, Audrey says, I haven't practiced the four elements meditation for a while and I forgot how soothing it can be. Yeah. And yes, oh, the earth element. The earth element is so good. Um, I know as part of my practice, especially if things are feeling, um, you know, like there's so much chaos in our world, that earth element is so incredible. Um, you know, there have been times in my practice where, you know, just, just going down and, and lying my body on the earth and feeling like, what is it to rest our bones on the earth? What is it to feel our earth element resting on earth element and to really take in the support of that? So powerful. It can be such a profound thing and so, so, so safe, so holding um, because the earth element really does offer us that, that sense of stability. Yeah, beautiful. Mm. Um, Don says, I use too much effort. Any suggestions? That's a great question. You know, I think it's if, if you tend to be on the efforting side and the kind of doing, one thing that you could play around with is just setting that intention of instead of doing and efforting and kind of using that, you know, for want of a better word, that like yang energy that kind of goes outward playing with what would it be like if my intention for the practice was to be receptive and to just receive whatever wanted to show itself to me um, without it actually having to be anything and knowing that what you receive could be really subtle. Yeah, that's an awesome question. Thank you for asking it. Chloe says the air element is the one that felt really vivid. Yeah, feeling the air entering and leaving the mouth and lungs. Visualizing that connection, yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I think in some ways that that's one of the many reasons that practicing meditation with the breath is so powerful because we, we feel that kind of, we are in, we're in a constant reciprocal relationship with everything around us. You know, all the trees, all the plants, the air, the water, you know, all of it is going into that air element. And so we are in this constant relationship. And there's something that can be very beautiful about sensing into that in the breath. 
Okay, got another one in the chat. Um, Dolores, beautiful and powerful. Earth mountain, yeah. That earth element and the water, feeling that healing, nourishing, the sustaining of the fire. Yeah, the firing of nerves. I know you're recovering from surgery. We want those nerves to fire and bring a lot of warmth to that place. The air, that breath of life. Beautiful, beautiful. Oh, yeah. Jerry's asking Does anyone ever see an indigo or purple colored soft light flow? Um, during meditation, that's an awesome question. Um, you know, the experience of light in meditation generally, whether it's, um, <laughs> the Lord says just every day. <laughs> yep. Um, you know, the experience of light or color in meditation practice, this is another one of those, um, those places, right? Where um, in some meditation contexts, we might have that experience and be told like, Oh, yeah, that's just, you're just having, you know, your brain's doing things, whatever, just note it and move on. But if you connect into like, okay, what if I wanted a deeper understanding of that light or that color, you know, is, is there actually an energetic quality to that light or that color? Is there a feeling that comes with it? Emotional, physical, um, you know, something else? Is, is this is this something that um, has some kind of a meaning or support there for me? Is there something I, I need to know from this light? And I think those are really valid questions. When you, you look at um, so many different energy healing modalities, which, you know, the, the shamanic work has an energy medicine component, of course. Um, the, the depth hypnosis work that I do with clients also has a shamanic and energetic energy medicine component. And a lot of the time what we do is explore, okay, like what is the nature of, of that color, of that light? What, what is there for me to understand about it? And, you know, throughout you know, many, many centuries, thousands of years, when you, you learn about the chakra system, those correspond to different lights. Um, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of content kind of out there, uh, all in many different traditions about the way that light and energy can have healing uh, or transformational properties. Um, so I, I would say, Jerry, you're, you're not alone. And it might be worth exploring a little bit. And you can even in your meditation practice, um, when the light arises, just drop in the question, what do I need to know about this light? You may be able to understand a little bit more about what's happening there. Um, sometimes it opens up a, a portal, like viewing through a people and show scenes clear and vivid, like a digital screen. Yeah, yeah, it, it sounds to me um, like you're connecting to a, a particular field of consciousness and that this is, this is something that can be deepened and developed. You know, it's really worth exploring. Yeah. And so we're gonna um, move on a little bit. I, I can't believe how quickly um, time flies when we're, when we're spending time in this field. Um, really, yeah, just wild. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about um, the shamanic journey and also about the way that um, we see in, in some of the, the Buddhist stories and suttas, um, some of these different capacities arising. Um, so as, as plenty of you probably know, one of the, the most commonly known shamanic practices, which I mentioned earlier, is the shamanic journey. And this is a contemplative practice where the practitioner enters into an altered state of consciousness and connects to the unseen or to uh, a non-ordinary reality. And often in many, many cultures, the shamanic journey is supported by rhythmic repetitive drumming. Um, it's also in other cultures supported by chanting or uh, in Aboriginal Australian cultures, the playing of the didgeridoo. And what that sound does, I mean, consciousness is amazing. Uh, these 
human bodies, it's wild. The sound, that repetitive sound, actually entrains the brain to a place where we're more open and we're more readily able to enter into an altered trance-like state. And, you know, we, we all have this within us to, to some extent. And um, it can also be accessed through meditation and through hypnotherapeutic means. So, you know, when I work with people, I actually um, work both with drumming to help someone do a shamanic journey and also with um, a hypnotherapeutic kind of guided meditation to support folks. And we're gonna be exploring more on the guided meditation side of things today. Um, but if it's something that you're you're interested in learning more about, you're so welcome to reach out. Um, so, okay, what do I mean when I talk about the unseen or non-ordinary reality? Um, this is something that's really uh, individual to our interpretation. We could understand non-ordinary reality or or that which is not seen as the wisdom of the earth as the subconscious mind. We could think of it as a larger, larger field of awareness or a larger field of consciousness. Um, it tends to be kind of how I hold it. And we could think about it too as something else. Um, but, but ultimately the, the flavor is really um, this understanding that there's so much more going on in our world, in our consciousness than we see on our day-to-day -day basis when we're, you know, going about our life and texting our friends or typing on the computer or driving the car. And each one of us likely has had some experiences of this in our meditation. It might be small and subtle. It might be big and kind of earth shattering for us. Um, so when we sit in meditation and we feel connected to that, greater field of wisdom or compassion or those moments when, you know, insight strikes on the cushion and there's something that's illuminated in a really powerful and onward leading way for our own personal development, our own growth and healing. You know, that sense of knowing that can sometimes arise. That, that's a little bit the flavor that I'm talking about. You know? When, when something that is quite out of the ordinary visits us in that way, or we visit it. And, you know, this can take place, I, I do want to name, this can be pleasant or unpleasant. It is not just, you know, rainbows and angels, although that's, I think, when people talk about non-ordinary reality, a lot of the time what we focus on is, is that kind of beautiful, compassionate, supportive, and and it very often is. Um, but also, when we sit on the cushion and we're struggling with our inner critic or our own self-doubt, and it feels immense, and we start to work with it on the cushion in a skillful way, you know, working with it energetically, working to understand it, um, all of that, we're working with an aspect of the unseen. We're working with that energy that's coming forth. We also are touching into it when we, we practice metta and we kind of feel that arising of, of that benevolence, that care. You know, sometimes when you practice uh, loving kindness or metta practice, it's like you're evoking just the, yeah, that pure love that pure care, that pure support. This too, we're engaging with the seen and the unseen. We're on the cushion, we're with our lives, we're with that personal lived experience, and we're also with that broader energetic and spiritual experience, those dimensions of the practice as well. So, you know, all of you as meditators, you, you walk in these worlds. You absolutely do. And when we go into a period of, say, long retreat, or we cultivate a shamanic journey practice, or we're in meditation or prayer or ceremony in some way in our, in our lives, 
what we're doing is we're intentionally engaging with the unseen, with non-ordinary reality. We're intentionally engaging with non-ordinary reality and we're engaging with it, with this intention that it can be a teacher for us and that we can work skillfully with it for our own inner growth, our own spiritual development, and also like, ideally to be of benefit to the world in some way. And, you know, in the modern Buddhist context, we, we don't always talk about the way that when we sit down on the cushion, we're engaging with this unseen energy. But when we look at the Buddhist text and the stories of the Buddha's life, we, and when we also understand the etymological roots of that word shaman, we start to see that there is a, a consistent engagement with non-ordinary reality in the story of the Buddha. We start to see the shamanic fabric of early Buddhism. One of the, the stories that I, I think best represents this is the story of the Buddha's awakening. The Buddha vowed to stay sitting in meditation until he became enlightened. He made a resolve that he was not going anywhere until he woke up and he sat down on the earth underneath the Bodhi tree and he stayed there throughout the night, just deep in meditation, deep in this contemplative practice, connected to the earth under the Bodhi tree with the elements. And as he sat there, all of his fears and doubts arose every temptation, every desire, every ego trip, all the craving. We all have a lot of that rolling around in our, in our psyches, in our energetic field. And the stories of the Buddha's awakening describe this as the demon Mara. This non-ordinary, unseen being who embodies negativity who personifies doubt and greed, evil and temptation and terror. We talk about Mara, this energy personified. And Mara was trying his hardest to just knock the Buddha off his feet. He sent armies to terrify the Buddha. He sent beautiful women to tempt him. Mara whispered in the Buddha's ear and told him that if he got up now, Mara would give him everything he ever wanted, that he could become such a powerful ruler, that he could just have every, every desire, every craving, anything that. And the Buddha kept on practicing. He sat there through it all. And, you know, Mara was powerful and terrifying, but the Buddha, Buddha remained resolute. And in the end, uh, Mara was getting pretty fed up because he was so unsuccessful in throwing every weapon he had at the Buddha. And so Mara threw his final weapon at the Buddha, the weapon of doubt. And Mara looked at the Buddha and he asked him, who do you think you are to sit on this spot and seek enlightenment? We've all had those moments, right? Who do you think you are to want to get free, to want to do better, to want to thrive? And the Buddha reached down and touched the earth. All of those beautiful statues of the Buddha where he has one hand pointing down, that is the Buddha touching the earth. And he said, the earth is my witness. And the story goes, in many retellings of this, that the spirit of the earth herself rose up to support and witness the Buddha. And that very shortly thereafter, Mara fled and the Buddha reached enlightenment. And I speak about this again in the Buddha's first teaching. Um, 
the English translation is the setting the wheel of the Dhamma in motion. And in this sutta, immediately after his awakening, the Buddha gives his first teaching. And the deva, these spirits of the earth, all rise up. And as the Buddha gives his first teaching, and as the devas of the earth rise up, so do countless beings in countless other unseen realms. This is the first teaching of the Buddha. This is in the Buddhist canon. And we see imagery like that in so much of the Buddhist story and so many of the suttas. You know, the Jataka tales retelling the story of the Buddha's past life. The miraculous powers that the suttas share that enlightenment can bestow. And it, it ranges from the ability to recount past lives, the ability to become invisible. They say the, the Buddha could walk through walls and be in two places at once. But in one sutta, the Buddha actually, you know, duplicates himself to be in multiple places, to be doing multiple things. And what's interesting is actually one of the descriptions of a shaman includes that ability to be in two worlds at once. And often we're talking about these two worlds as the, the world of the seen and the world of the unseen or ordinary and non-ordinary reality, but that's fair. And many shamanic practitioners um, have a deep understanding of past lives as well. So, you know, there's, there are these threads that if we start to get curious and we start to tug at it, we really begin to see. And in the, the Buddhist canon, we also discover stories of how to really work with some of these experiences in a skillful manner. One of the, the best examples of this is the story of uh, the, the teaching of the metta practice that at some point, you know, when the Buddha was established, he had a group of monks who had been sent into a forest to practice during the rains retreat. And this would be, you know, the, the big chunk of practice where they'd be dedicating a few months just to being deeply, deep, deeply in meditation. And the monks got to this forest and it said that the spirits of the forest didn't, didn't like them. The monks kind of barreled in. They didn't, they didn't really seek permission of the forest. They, didn't, they weren't living in a way that was um, in great relationship with the forest. And it said that the spirits of the forest got angry and they set to terrorizing the monks. And the monks fled from the forest and they went back to the Buddha. And the Buddha gave them the metta practice. He gave them the metta sutta, the, the practice of, of sending metta so that they could go back into the forest. And the monks didn't want to go back, but the Buddha said, no, I'm giving you this tool, go back and use it. And when the monks began to engage deeply with the metta practice, the spirits of the forest calmed down. And they started to live in greater harmony. And actually, after a period of time, the harmony between the forest and the monastics became so strong that the forest was deeply supporting the monks, really deeply helping them wake up. And so, you know, this is, this is part of the path that we're walking whether it's in the, the Buddhist meditation context or the shamanic practice context, every step on the path we take, we're learning how to work skillfully with difficult energies. We're learning how to transmute pain and suffering into wisdom and compassion. And that's really the path that we're walking. 